I'm World Cup champion Megan Klingenberg. Wondering who you should root for at the FIFA Women's World Cup? I'm hosting a new podcast, my new favorite, Pupalista, where I will introduce you to soccer's brightest stars and the causes they are championing. From the 22-year-old American phenom speaking out about student-athlete mental health. I try to just like approach everything with like you don't know what someone's going through. To the U.S. defender who travels to tournaments with her young son. Am I ever going to be able to run for five minutes straight? Check out my new favorite Futbolista wherever you listen to podcasts. Edit audio. What is the WNBA? Ah, that's the women's basketball which I absolutely love basketball. I'm useless at it, and if a ball comes towards me, I scream. But um, good for the women that can actually play it. This is Rebound Revolution, a not-so-basketball podcast bringing you the revolutionary on and off the court happening in the WNBA. From queer baddies to history to ones to watch, join me, Money, as we get into it all. This week, my guest is Laura Lewis. We talk about what it means to have an intergenerational basketball legacy in your family, healing through basketball, and about her team, All My Relations. Brushing off that energy. What I like to do is just basically like brush off my chest, brush off my shoulders. Like I'm just like, all right, new start. I continuously go back to that. So after the 2022 NCAA championship game, I'm scrolling through WNBA Twitter, watching everyone give Dawn Staley her flowers for winning her second championship as the head coach of South Carolina. Rightfully so, Dawn Staley is an icon. But as I'm scrolling, I come across this TikTok by a creator named Jaren Jaren Jaren, who happens to be a fan who was at the game. In this short clip, the creator shares a story about watching Dawn Staley take off the t-shirt she was wearing and give it to someone in the crowd. Who was that someone? None other than res ball icon Renel Di Vicente. Renel Di played against Dawn in the inaugural season of the W after signing with the Phoenix Mercury, making her the first Native American to play in the WNBA. Okay, why am I gushing over Renel Di right now? Well, You'll hear more about her because she's my MVP this week, but mostly because indigeneity gets presented through most media as an identity of the past, as the history of America, and not as the vibrant communities that are fragrantly alive right now. And we see this in the W, both in players of the past and in teams of today. There's even a team owned by the Mohegan tribe, the Connecticut Sun, Creating spaces for culture and stories of Indigenous women to be told has an impact that goes way beyond the basketball court. Right now, there are states trying to outlaw and who have outlawed the teachings of true American history. So it's an act of resistance to see Native and Black women collaborating on every level in the WNBA. Hey, Laura. Hey. Thank you so much for coming on Rebound Revolution. Oh my gosh, thank you for inviting me. I'm super excited to be here. So first, can you just tell me a little bit about yourself? What brings you to women's basketball? Sure. So my name is Laura Lewis. I am from the Nishka, Simshan, Talpen, and Clinkett Nation. So if you basically look at the top left corner of British Columbia, a lot of those are clustered nations that I'm pretty much all a part of. And like, my love for basketball started a little late in my life at the age of 13. But the more I grew into it, the more I realized that it's really in my DNA and like how even my grandfather played it before I was even born. So. Oh, wait, what? We got some intergenerational basketball history. Hundred <laughs> percent. My grandfather played basketball. My aunts and uncles, my cousins. You know, I currently play on the team for all my relations, which I've yes. either played with a few of my cousins or like, you know, just people that I consider as my family and as my sisters. OK, so what's your earliest basketball memory? The earliest basketball memory that I have is um, I wasn't very coordinated back in the day when I was first starting at the age of 13. So I just remember that I was trying to go out for a layup and I ended up charging a girl. And then I was known as Bulldozer <laughs> for a little while. Ooh, but that nickname, though. 
<laughs> what makes it more funny is that like I've been five four since I was thirteen. So like me bulldozing people at that age, I'm like, I don't know how it happened, but it did. Do you think where you grew up like informs your style of play? I mean, I feel as though like growing up, like it definitely like made me have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder. But mm. the more that I grew up, the more I realized that like I needed to play a little bit more composed, but that doesn't mean that like, if somebody fouls me, I'm still going to call them out for it. But I definitely feel as though like, I always have this competitive edge where I just feel as though like, I always have something to prove. Like I always just need to improve, be better, prove that like, even though I'm an inner city kid, that like, you know, I still got game and I can still play. That's where the best players come from, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) The inner city gives us the swag to play, the skill to play. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Do you have any, like, pre-game rituals or, like, superstitions before going out on the court? My ritual that I like to do is just, like, brushing off that energy. So, like, what I like to do is just basically, Mm -hmm. like, brush off my chest, brush off my shoulders. Like, I'm just like, all right new start and like even if I like mess up during a game or something like that that I continuously go back to that and I come back to my breathing and I'm just like all right new play oh my gosh that's amazing I love that okay so in my day job I'm a therapist and so I love that as like a grounding activity too to just like bring you back to the moment that you're in and not like you know staying anxious about what's to come or like filled with regret about what just happened just like roots you in the moment totally and it was honestly like something that like I learned from one of like the Slay With Tooth members um that's where my partner's from and so what he would always do is just like whenever I'm feeling like a little bit of anxiousness or something like he would just kind of like just brush it off for me and just be like all right you can let it go it's weight off your shoulders like shake it off Yes. And just keep moving forward. And like, so I've incorporated that into my game and I, I definitely appreciate it. And it just feels like a little bit of that culture too, that like is incorporated mm-hmm. while I play. How so? So like in our culture, like we do things of like cedar brushing. So like that's something where it's like cedar is very cleansing. It's cleansing to the body, to the spirit and to the mind, and to your heart. So like we would do these things in our culture that like, we would take a cedar bow and like brush ourselves down. Oh, yes. So like symbolically, I'm like thinking about myself of like, all right, I'm brushing myself down. I'm taking off that energy. I'm renewing myself. Mm-hmm. I'm taking this moment to like pause and be one with myself and ground myself. And so like in that sense, like basketball for me is also my medicine. So I try and like incorporate these things, but also to like, it's a form of release for me. So in that way I can like, mm-hmm. not only stay physically fit, but also to like keep my spirit well-rounded as well. Oh my gosh. My brain just started like connecting so many things like basketball as medicine, not just through like the movement, but also the rituals and practice that we have around it to like get ready mm-hmm. to release all the feelings in the moment to like make uh-huh. the free throw or <laughs> whatever it is. Totally. And it's just like, you're always like surrounding yourself in like stressful environments when you're playing basketball, for example. And like, as soon as like, you have to like, get into the zone and you have to focus. And it's just helpful for me to like, not only incorporate that as like, oh, I can just do this as like a small little outlet, but also to incorporating like, when I'm feeling overwhelmed again, just like continuing what I practice and while I play basketball, like in my day to day life. Yeah. It also makes me think about like how much culture informs all parts of us, you know? And so even as you Mm -hmm. play, the things that you do to get ready as a player are like deeply culturally connected. Totally. Me and my team, we actually do these things on like, if we feel as though like we're not really connecting on the court, then we actually, in our last tournament, we actually did a, a healing circle. So in that way, we can not only connect as players, but also as we like to call ourselves a sisterhood. So like connect as a family as well. Like last year, we ended up winning the All Native Basketball Tournament, which is the largest tournament in BC. And so Mm -hmm. it was an amazing experience. And to also like have culture ground us before we actually like won that tournament was an amazing thing. Yeah. Okay. So just like a a structural question real quick. So the All Native Basketball Conference is the league and then All My Relations is the team. So the All Native Basketball Tournament 
is like this annual tournament. There is no prize money. It's just all for the glory, all for the gloating. Yes. And how it started. So I remember when I said that my grandfather played yeah. basketball. Mm-hmm. So back then, it was basically just different villages and different reserves um, within northern BC who were rival nations. And uh-huh. they were wanting to prove which nation was the best. Uh-huh. And, you know, my grandfather, who is Nishka and from the King Kolis village, he represented his village and his nation, and they won that first tournament. Oh, and period. then, yeah, <laughs> like, I was, like, you have no idea how much, like, this tournament runs through my blood. Like, <laughs> the competitiveness, yeah. I kid you not, like, I will dive on that floor and sacrifice my body if that means that we can possess the ball. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so my grandfather played in that tournament, and I believe it started around, like, the 1960s when, like, it became this huge tournament. And I know within the women's bracket, which came to flourishing in, like, the 1990s, there were, like, 16 teams that we were going up against. And that's going all across British Columbia and Alaska. So we essentially we like created our own little community and represented East Vancouver. Yeah. So we're just like this little club team in East Van. And, you know, because this tournament was originally for those who were on reserve, not many teams exactly like us, not many reserves exactly support us. But, you know, slowly we're like gaining some support, gaining those fans, gaining that respect that like we train just as hard as anybody else. And, you know, there's a lot of things that we also struggle with as a urban indigenous team. Okay, tell us a little bit about All My Relations. Sure. Um, So the All My Relations basketball, it started maybe like, I want to say like 20 years ago. And this had a lot to do with um, Jolene Mitten, who... She didn't start the team, but she like continued it on and made it to what it is now. And like, she was the one who would continuously like bring the girls in. And she was like, you know what? Like, it's okay if you can't really play because you can run, you can dribble. You're going to play with us now. Like, Mm -hmm. no questions asked. And she brought these people in and she not only brought them in, but she brought them together, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. And so that's how it kind of began. And gradually we made it into something bigger on like, not only just within the team, but giving back to the community, um, you know, like raising awareness about MMIW, um, talking about like intergenerational trauma. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but you just said MMIW. Can you say a little bit more about what that is? Totally. So missing and murdered indigenous women, like right now in Canada, actually recently it's been, finally acknowledged and this is the thing that we as indigenous people have been fighting for because yep. missing indigenous women because we're overly sexualized and we're such a small group but like i know that it has affected my life and me losing a few of my friends and not seeing them yeah. ever again i know that it has affected a few of my other teammates we were actually trying to look for um, one of my teammates relatives her name's chelsea Porman. She was found but unfortunately wasn't in the best circumstances that we would have liked it's a harsh reality that we as indigenous women always have to face and like the two-spirited community and even the men in our community which isn't really talked about yeah. either and how we are just always sought out and like disregarded and like the cops don't really look for us they kind of just yeah. like oh she's probably just at her friends or oh she probably ran away or oh she's probably just on a bender somewhere yeah. So it's continuously making up these excuses, even though like in reality, like we're crying and screaming and yelling just to try and get our voices heard all the time. You know, we as a team, because we're personally affected by it, we always try and raise awareness and like sh- try and utilize our platform to also share the like, struggle that our community continuously faces. I think it was in 2014, I took a trip to Ottawa 
and like learned so much about MMIW and just saw like the natural overlaps between like say her name here in the States and MMIW in the States and in Canada. Right. But Mm -hmm. yeah, like the way like black WNBA players are wearing the say her name shirts and seeing that kind of reflected with missing murdered Mm -hmm. indigenous women. It's like this huge thing of like, why aren't people acknowledging this? You know, and it's just, it's finally nice that like, I can see it within like my lifetime that like there's slowly starting to be change in that. Yeah. I think a lot about the saying like, who got us but us? Like we're the ones who uplift each other's stories. But I think the us through basketball is growing, right? Like the the people that you see as like community end up being like so many more people than you would have expected because you bond around this shared love of the game or like learning from each other there. And then you actually start to learn about each other's lives, like the struggles, the differences, mm-hmm. the similarities. And then we end up just being a community of badass women. <laughs> Definitely. People think it's just a game. But like for all my relations, it's never just about the game of basketball. And like all of a sudden you're just on the court and then off the court, you just don't know each other. It really is a family. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's kind of funny because like we really are a sisterhood because sometimes too, like there's banter, there's like teammates who just don't get along within certain moments or certain Mm -hmm. aspects. But it's always like at the end of the day, like regardless about what happens, like we know that we have each other's back and it's funny and it's like, man, we really are sisters and we'll like joke about it. We'll laugh about it. But yeah, it's nice to have a core group of women who are like, some are nurses or like for myself, like I work in an Aboriginal youth safe house. I'm working social work now, like, and you know, some are young mothers or single mothers. It's beautiful to see like all of these women like flourish and grow into the Mm -hmm. intelligent, beautiful beings that they are. And just to be a little like portion in their life but also to like cheering them on on and off Mm -hmm. the court like it's it's always the like best feeling yes it's doing all the work to like sustain and recreate community absolutely yeah (laughs) how did you get involved (laughs) with all my relations so I was either playing at my high school or playing at friendship center for indigenous people and so it's got indigenous art all around it and that was also a place that I found refuge growing up in East Van. And so all my relations actually started out at the Friendship Center. Like that's where they would practice and that's where they would play drop in. And so they began keeping their eyes on me when I was like 15, 16. As soon as I turned 18, they like scooped me up. They're like, you're coming on to our team. Like you're going to play with us. You're going to scrimmage with us. Like you're coming up to the all native basketball tournament. And I mean, like I went off a couple of times, went off to play college ball for a little while, but every time, like they always invited me back with open arms. And that's like Mm -hmm. a continuous thing that we always try and do as a team is just like, regardless of where you are at in your life, whether you move, just know once you're on my relations, you're always on my relations. Always on my relations. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Oh my gosh. So you have to be 18 to play? Not necessarily, you don't have to be 18, but I waited until I was 18 until I could go by myself and, you know, kind of not necessarily like have a chaperone. There are those that play who are under 18, but it's like a 17 and a half hour drive from Vancouver, BC. Whoa. And when I was 18, like we were a broke team. So (laughs) we would do that drive and driving in February there was still snow, black ice, you know what I mean? So it was mm-hmm. a dangerous trek because that's how it was, was mm-hmm. that we were basically like taking time off work, putting in our own money. So then that way we can go up to this tournament, pay for the trip ourselves and then get ourselves back. But like now that we're kind of like not only a nonprofit and, you know, we're always giving back to the community, always ensuring that we have funds. So mm-hmm. now it's kind of come to this point where we don't have to entirely worry about the finances, but it's still a portion of it does come out of our own pocket. Yeah. But our team is now kind of like, we're all getting older. I myself am going to be 29 this year. So like, I'm not getting any younger. So we're trying to like raise up a lot of like our younger girls who are coming mm-hmm. out of the junior all native teams, which is like um, 18 and under 13 and under and like trying to call them in 
and like incorporate them into our team and understand like the community that we've built. I love how 29 is old in basketball years. Oh, <laughs> I'm feeling it now. Like 18 year old me was like, oh yeah, I could go for another basketball game. But now I'm like, wait, I got to do my stretches. I got to do my warm up. I got to have yes. an ice pack, like have that Tylenol on hand. I don't know if I'm going to need it or not. It's definitely like trying to embrace and love my body at all stages and like just yeah. acknowledging the fact that like, no, I'm not, I'm not young anymore. Like all these mm-hmm. kids can run circles around me at this point. And like me trying to keep up, like I do my best, but realistically I need to see myself for who I am and still love myself and appreciate that. Like my body's taking me this far. Mm-hmm. That feels like something you've discovered about yourself through basketball. I'm thinking about what you said about basketball being medicine. Like that feels like a lesson in self-appreciation and self-love? 100%. I mean, younger me was definitely a lot harder on myself. You're your worst critic. You know what I mean? And like, not only having like beautiful beings encouraging you and speaking life into you, but also to like learning the ability to do that also for yourself. I'm still battling with those kinds of things, but like, Mm -hmm. it's definitely not as bad as when I was a teenager. And like, you know, having that ability to finally acknowledge and be like, you know what? Like, I still need to love me for where I'm at. And I mm-hmm. might not be what I want to be right now, but like, you know what? I still love me. I still appreciate me. Yeah. We heard you loud and clear. You love the WNBA and want more analysis and insight on your favorite players. Welcome to Queens of the Court, an Odyssey original podcast. I'm your girl, Cheryl Swoops. And I'm Jordan Robinson. All season long, we'll be bringing you the post-game analysis that you crave and sitting down for interviews with athletes across the W. You can listen to Queens of the Court on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. So there is like this res ball city ball divide then mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, it's, okay. <laughs> it's not as bad as it used to be like I remember when mm-hmm. I was a teenager and we would play in junior all native and it's basically just like those who are 18 and under similar concept like you'd mm-hmm. play with against different reserves the fans were throwing pennies onto the gym floor to try and make our team trip like it gets what? that intense and that wild yeah I mean, it's not as bad, but the fans Mm -hmm. are still very intense. It's an interesting environment. It's really hard when the fans are going against you, but when they're cheering for you, makes a world of a difference. Do y'all have like home court advantage, you know, like when y'all play the city game? Not at all. Not at all. So this tournament is like, like I said, it's a 17 and a half hour drive away from Vancouver. And so this tournament happens at the Civic Center in Prince Rupert. Mm-hmm. And like the women's division, we play on the NBA Grizzlies Vancouver old basketball court that they used to have. Uh-huh. And the All Native Tournament had bought that court and they put it in their ice rink arena. So we're playing on top of ice. As soon as you stop running, like get ready to start cramping. Oh my goodness. You really have to love the game in order to go to this tournament, especially if you're in the women's division. Like I've played against women who are like 50s and in their 60s, but still can (laughs) hoop. And I'm just like, I can't wait to be that age and like have my grandbabies cheering me on and be like, oh, grandma. (laughs) (laughs) That is so dope. What? It's, it's like freaking amazing because like I see yeah. like some of these elders who are still hooping around like these youngins and I'm like dang I hope when I get to that age that I'm still doing that yes yeah <laughs> oh I love that you said that y'all are just like a little club team but y'all are not y'all were the first <laughs> Vancouver team to win the championship okay <laughs> so can yeah. you talk about that championship run so East Vancouver has never won a banner in the All Native Basketball Tournament. We've come close. Never happened. So last year was kind of like our year where like, okay, we've been living, breathing basketball. We've been doing our best to like stay connected as a team. And now let's show them like we mean business. I think it was like our second game in and we went to the loser's bracket. And it's one of those kind of tournaments where it's like you lose 
twice and you're out. Mm. So we fought through the back door. Mm -hmm. And mind you, like the draw in the tournament can be so hectic and so crazy. And there were days where we were playing like two games a day. What? This tournament only lasts for a week. Two games a day? So there's no such thing as being a bench player then. Like everybody is constantly playing. I mean, yeah, this tournament, like res ball can be so like, it takes a lot of like grit. Really physical. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, of elbows being thrown. Yeah, I was you know. about to say, some people might say some fouls. Some... <laughs> but like, People yeah. have like dislocated their shoulder, like they've broken their arm. ACLs have been torn at this tournament. Yeah. So yeah, every every body counts when you go up. <laughs> everybody and everybody parts. <laughs> mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was quite the battle, and like ultimately to the Starbirds that we played against, who are an interior team and they're also a young team but they always play together and they grew up playing together and they always come in second and you know that was also the team that everybody was cheering for and so what ended up happening was we made it to finals and the starbirds were basically like oh we got this in the bag like they were Mm -hmm. casual but we were in it to freaking win it yeah. we were not about to give up and like there was a couple times too they were actually like up by like nine points by like the first quarter or like the second quarter at that point like it was just trying to hang on even though yes. like we were so dead like we <laughs> were hanging on by just pure willpower and just mm-hmm. trying to like make sure that we we brought home that banner and brought home that trophy. So by the end of it, everybody was surprised. All the fans were cheering and standing. I know our team was just crying. Like we ran to the center mm-hmm. of the gym, like screaming our little heads off and like just in this huge huddle and just like crying. Cause like we've been wanting this. Like I know that I've been going to this tournament and been a part of the team for like 10 years at that point. And like to yeah. be able to be like, with some of the girls that like I've known since I started with the team and wow. just knowing that like, man, we finally did it. We finally yeah. made it. And like a part of me too was like, I know I made my grandpa proud. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I know that like when I came back to Vancouver, there were a lot of like youth that were like, man, I saw your game. Mm-hmm. Kids that I didn't even know, like kids on the reserve yeah. out in Slay with mm-hmm. teams out in North Vancouver were like, I watched the game. And, like, we were cheering for you guys. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. I feel like I can't wait until the movie about this gets released in, like, 10 years. I mean, I feel so. I mean, I feel like so. It's, like, the the underdog team that everybody overlooks. And you know what I mean? Like, I remember when we had, like, the news kind of covering our team last year. Like, I was informing them, like, we're like the diamonds of the downtown east side. Like, we're always under pressure. Like, we're always on the go. Like, nobody ever sees us. Nobody ever acknowledges Mm -hmm. us. But, like, we're working really hard. And we just want that moment to shine. And we just want that moment to, like, be acknowledged. And, you know, Mm -hmm. after all that hard work and after all that time just, like, laying low, like, we just wanted that championship. Y'all got it. Y'all brought it home. Oh, we did it. I mean, (laughs) this year was kind of like, oh, no, we had to give it to somebody else. But not actually. But, like, we came in third. And, like, that's still an accomplishment considering that we were a team that definitely had a target on our back. But I'm really happy to say that the Starboards actually won this year's tournament. And, like, they have been fighting to win first place for so long and like I know a few of their players and I'm I'm definitely friends with a few of them as well so I'm like you know what if anybody else could win this year's tournament I would want it to go to them like they 110% deserve it yes well we see (laughs) y'all champions and also talking about seeing y'all so my favorite team is the indiana fever like in the WNBA, and i just love their blue jerseys like i love the jerseys and i think y'all's jerseys are fly too so can you talk a little bit about like the design i don't know how much input y'all had into it oh totally hold on let me try and grab my jersey yeah 
Because you know I was on the Instagram page. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my number, 33. So all my relations, like, if you see there's little writings yes. on the back of the dream catcher. Oh my and gosh. like there's Haida Nation, Stolo, Metis, Silks, Tall Tan, Squamish. Like these are all the players that have played on our team and who represented their nation while playing. Mm-hmm. And so as a whole, we are representing our nation. And that's what the team of all my relations means is mm-hmm. those that were before us, those who are after us, like there are kids. All my relations is basically an encompass of everyone. Yeah. So the beauty of this is that like we still get to represent our nations while also representing our community of East Vancouver. Oh my gosh, that just blew me away. Oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> okay, I'm seeing your jersey and I have to ask you about the number 33 because some of my favorite players have worn 33. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about Simone Augustus. Three is like my number. So what went into you picking 33? So um, three is my favorite number. My I too. love the number three, but the number three was already taken. So that was taken by somebody else. And I'm like, you know what? It's not something that I'm going to fight over. So it just basically was like, all right, well, I'll take 33. Like double the digits, double the luck, double my favorite number. But later on in life, my mom kind of like let me in on like, actually, that was my number when I was younger. I had no idea. But she was like, yeah, 33 used to be my number that I used to like play like soccer or baseball or basketball. And I'm like, Oh, (laughs) so now it kind of like comes to this point where I'm just carrying on this legacy. Yes, I feel like that's like the story of your basketball career. It's like carrying (laughs) on legacy. Hundred percent. I mean, it was unintentional, but it just like it just felt so natural, and it just felt like it was just so fitting. So, is there any team in the W that you root for? I haven't watched the WNBA games only because it's not exactly always accessible in Canada. Yeah, but. Getting to watch Kelsey Plum Um, and like when I went to Vegas, like I got to go see the Aces and getting to watch them play. Like I'm just like, dang, like just the pace, but also to like the agility. Like I'm just like, I'm always just blown away. I'm like, wow, female athletes are just freaking amazing. You know, as an indigenous person, like following Shoni Schimmel or yeah. Oh, there's this other woman. She played in 1997. She is Navajo. Rinaldi? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. yeah. Like the, that indigenous representation. I'm like, this yeah. is what I live for. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, yeah. absolutely like just getting to watch like a little bit of res ball in the WNBA. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, hopefully we'll get some more of it, you know? That, right. I feel like they they call the, like, smallest, tiniest fouls. I'm like, oh, you have not seen a foul, okay? <laughs> like, let's, <laughs> let, let's let this game be physical, okay? <laughs> yeah. You don't even... <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any advice for uh, Native Indigenous girls who might be interested in basketball? For me, it's basically just like, come out and watch. You don't even have to play, but come and watch. Figure out if it sparks passion and if it sparks excitement, then follow it. Keep Continue like attending, continue like practicing and, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, like I started at a late age, but if it's what you love, continue doing it. And don't let anybody tell you that like, you're never going to make it to a certain level because ultimately mm-hmm. you're the only one that can tell your story. Yes. I think it's so important you said that, Laura, as a 5-4 champion, you know, <laughs> for real, because I think a lot of times just off of people's imagination of what they expect a basketball player to look like or be they will tell young folks that they can't play just because they're not you know like five nine five six grade yeah i I always tell myself like i may be vertically challenged (laughs) but like uh, give me a ball and i'll play big okay (laughs) you know so i remember like when i started playing at like 14 is finally when i started getting like 
uh, aspect of basketball. And because that like I was five four and everybody was still kind of shorter than me at around that age, I was actually put in as Pope. <laughs> Fun fact. But for me, who has never grown an inch after grade eight. Like, <laughs> I was a post in, player. I was a post player. And then you have people like me who like I'm five ten and I've probably been this height since like sixth or seventh grade, was heavily recruited to play basketball. And then they saw my uncoordinated clumsy behind <laughs> on the on the court. And they were like, um, maybe you should just like keep the score. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so are there places we can watch All My Relations games from here in the States? Do you know that? Um, We do have a YouTube channel of like a few of our basketball games. All My Relations AMR Basketball. That's our page for YouTube. And where can folks find you, Laura? So on Instagram, I'm actually Antila, A-U-N-T-I-E dot L-A-H. And that's on my Instagram. And that's also on my TikTok page. All right. Well, we'll make sure to put all those links in the show notes of this episode. I want to say thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for allowing me to share not only about like the Indigenous basketball community, a little bit of information about murdered and missing Indigenous women, MMIW. Also too, like, especially sharing about my teammates and about my team and our story and, you know, really attempted to like incorporate community in our team. I appreciate you like highlighting and giving us the information and uh, yeah, anything I could do to like uplift the stories and experiences of like indigenous women and native women. I just feel like we have been in community with each other for like generations as like black and indigenous folks. And we have to continue our movements mirror each other so closely like so yeah we gotta keep that connection definitely truly appreciate that thank you (laughs) there are a lot of dope players in the w but not everyone gets their flowers and i want to make sure they do so i'm gonna shout out a player who everyone should know in a little segment called (laughs) money's mvp this week, my MVP is Reneldi Basenti. Now, like you heard me say a little bit earlier, Reneldi is best known for being the first Native American WNBA player in 1996 when she signed with the Phoenix Mercury. But Reneldi is also the first and only female basketball player to be inducted into the American Indian Athletic Hall of Fame. And in 2013, she was the first women's basketball player to have her jersey retired by Arizona State University, her alma mater where she played and won a lot of things, okay? A unique thing you should know that I think is so cute about Rinaldi is that she was on an episode of Sesame Street about repetition. And so she used basketball as a metaphor of practicing and how to get better at doing things. And I'm not the only one who thinks that Rinaldi Basenti deserves her flowers. The WNBA thinks that Rinaldi deserves her flowers as well, because in 2022, she was a WNBA Believe in Women honoree, where she got to tell her story about starting to play basketball at five years old, being encouraged by her dad to get better at dribbling, and sticking with it. I think another reason why Rinaldi deserves her flowers is because she's looked at as a foremother for Indigenous women in basketball. She really laid out a path for Native women to see themselves on the national stage. And for that, she definitely deserves her flowers. Is there a player you think should be my MVP? Let me know. Welcome to the Orange Carpet. Now, we know these W players don't just give their all to the game. They also like to look real good doing it. So in this little segment, we roll out the Orange Carpet to give some shine to players, past and present, killing the fashion game. 
from signature hairstyles to the unforgettable shoe game. Let's get into the styles that we love to see. This week, I'm rolling out the orange carpet for the Connecticut Sun jerseys. As part of the 25th anniversary celebration of the WNBA, the league unveiled a collab with Nike for all new jerseys for each team. And the Connecticut Sun jerseys honoring the Mohegan tribe and the tribe's former medicine woman are some of the most detailed basketball jerseys I have ever seen. (laughs) Like I mentioned earlier, the Connecticut Sun are owned by the Mohegan tribe and play at the Mohegan Sun Arena in Connecticut. So it makes perfect sense that their jerseys will honor the rich history of the Mohegan tribe. The home jerseys are called the Explorer Edition, and they're in the classic orange color of the team. The detailing, though, on those orange jerseys symbolizes the Mohegan understanding of life force and unity. And what is the sun if not life force? But my favorites, and I think my favorites for every team, are the Rebel Edition jerseys. For the Connecticut Sun, their Rebel Edition jerseys are this brilliant blue color, which is apparently the same color as the Medicine Woman's garb for the Mohegan tribe. And it looks incredible on the court. It doesn't matter if you have like terrible seats all the way up at the top, you can see those blue uniforms. The jerseys also have Kisik across the chest, which is the Mohegan word for sun. I think it's so powerful and important that the Mohegan tribe got to have input, represent one of their women heroes, and have their culture symbolized and not misused by a major sports team. How iconic. This is how you do it. I can't wait to see Natisha Heidemann and Brianna Jones back in Connecticut Sun jerseys and on the court this season. Let me know who else you think should be on the orange carpet. Rebound Revolution is an edit audio original podcast created in collaboration with The Cube. I'm your host, Money McEachern, and this episode was produced by Melissa Houghton, Mick Finnegan, and me. It was edited, mixed, and mastered by Mick Finnegan. Our supervising producer is Anna Deshawn, Our executive producer is Steph Colburn. Thank you to Kathleen Speckert and the whole Edit Audio team. 